Um, so it's, I'm really looking forward to this event today with Professor Doug Powers on feeling belong. So at DRBU, we recently read this, there's this article in the New York Times called, there's a name for the blah you're feeling. It's called Languishing by Adam Grant. And we started to have some conversations about this feeling. And it turns out a lot of people can kind of relate to this languishing. And he kind of describes it as kind of this feeling of stagnation, of emptiness, and just kind of muddling about your day, just feeling kind of aimless, kind of low energy, and not really sure what's going to happen next. We would kind of wanted to talk about this and see if it resonates with other people, and then also see if a Buddhist perspective might bring something to this conversation or shed some light on this issue. Yeah, so in the, in the spirit of pedagogy at DRB, we wanted also to have more of a conversation and inquiry into this topic rather than just a lecture. So we hope you will also participate in this discussion and leave comments in the chat box. And at the end, we'll have time for some of the questions that you might have. We also invited a few DRBU people to kind of kickstart this conversation. So uh, Megan Sweet and Li Diao and myself will be sharing a little bit. And just to introduce Doug, I don't know if everybody knows him already, but he, he taught at Berkeley High for over 40 years. And now he's a professor at Dharmarum Buddhist University. He teaches um, at DRBU classes on various Buddhist sutras, on Western philosophy, and kind of a hallmark of Doug's teaching and work is how to bring Buddhism in contact with the modern mind and how, how can Buddhism be really relevant for people today. So just to kind of get started, I some of us are just going to share a little bit of our own our own personal experience of languishing and of blahness just to really like thoroughly seep into state and just bring it alive for everybody. Um, so one thing I was kind of reflecting on today was I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this kind of whole frenzy of, of going to the grocery store. And then I was just thinking recently about how now it's not quite so much of a frenzy, but and just thinking about like how there, these changes happen so quickly in these very kind of mundane daily activities. And I think those changes for me, like just seeing how these very, somewhat, you know, what I thought was a very reliable thing, like going to the grocery store, how that could change so quickly in, in such kind of a drastic way. It really made me, it also had like kind of these repercussions and it kind of had this domino effect in my life. And it kind of, it, it caused me to question other things and kind of shed some light on other issues of just like seeing this inherent instability in the world causes other things that I once relied on to become kind of toppled over and pushed around a little bit. And I find myself in this kind of, sometimes I'm kind of, there's definitely this muddling about and this kind of thinking about like, well, what's really, like, what is really important to me? Like what, what really matters and how, how do I go about even figuring that out anymore when there's so much of this kind of instability and the, these changes that just happen. And yeah, so in a, in a weird way, I feel like COVID actually has been very enlightening in that sense. Like it really opened up something and caused, you know, pushed me to question certain things and look at things in a different way. Yeah, so that's just kind of a little bit of some languishing or blondness that I draw on right now. And I wanted to pass it off to Megan and see if she would also share a little bit. Yeah. Thanks, Brenda. I've, I don't know, as I kind of sit with it, I've been thinking a lot about here and in, um, in the Bay Area uh, where I live, we have been going through these cycles with COVID and with the fire season overlapping. And there's a kind of like, I don't know, it's not just like this happened one year, it's like now we're into the second year. 
and there's a kind of a strange normalcy of having multiple natural disasters just happening kind of or um, a pandemic disaster and a natural disaster happening at the same time. I don't know. And I, I kind of think about like, hmm, like, is it just going to be like this for the rest of my life? Like more or less, because it's at least with the environmental crisis, it's it's a little hard to imagine things getting significantly better. Um, and I don't know, it just kind of makes me ask like, well, then what do I really what do I really find to be meaningful or where do I want to kind of put my energy? There's a kind of question there that arises, uh, just sort of looking out into the future and feeling that lack of, of stability. Um, and I think that does kind of produce a little bit of a, a, a languishing feeling. Um, you know, you kind of get normal. It's like the, you're used to the new normal. And then you sort of ask like, well, from this place, is this how I'm supposed to think about things? But then on what grounds would I even start to think about life from this new normal? Or am I still like hoping that it will become a different normal or where, where does normal even sit? Um, and then what does that mean about how I think about how I want to live and use my life? Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit from, from my world. Uh, Li Zhao? Yeah, I definitely uh, hear you both actually, but I have to say that I've you know, been think, thinking about this uh, feeling blah, but I have to say, I don't really want to, I don't really like to think about it or dwell on it, just even that topic, because I feel like this, this you know, dwelling on it kind of put me in a mode that is not very helpful in a way that, you know, it's, it's kind of like a mode that, um, you know, just stop appreciating life, but rather feel like life is in the limbo, you know, for the for the same reason that both of you have talked about, even just you know daily activity during the pandemic, and also, you know, the all the thing that you used to be stable are no longer stable, and um, um, for example, you know, planning things or even traveling and etc. It's like the thing that you you can use to reliably don't even need to think about, and then you can just depend on and plan and just like, okay, this is going to be like this. I'm going to do this, 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 this. And now it takes a lot more. Uh, you have to consider a lot more. And then, but then the rules are changing. Um, and those new rules, new normalcy hasn't really been, you know, really established yet. So, so, you know, just, just feeling like life moving on sometimes it, it takes a bit more mental energy or even physical energy to, to go through all the things that you, you want to do you need to um, definitely if I think about it like if I feel it I can definitely feel that kind of like you know a little bit there's more resistance to 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 do certain things uh, but again <laughs> I try not to think about it because it really is not very comfortable and then um yeah, it really um, just feel like the lack of clarity that is, it also, it just doesn't, it, you don't feel like there's any clarity coming up soon as well. I don't know, like, um, yeah, again, it's really early in the morning. I actually, some, I really appreciate waking up not feeling blah, but this is not helpful so much. Um, anyways, I'll share this much. I'll pass it back to you, Brenda. Thanks, Lizio and Megan, for sharing and uh, contacting the blondness. Yeah, I was wondering, maybe, Doug, this is a good time for you to share a little bit about your thoughts on this. Like, what are some of the underlying factors that are contributing to this shared sentiment? Yeah, so um, it's really good to get some reports from the actual mind of this languishing before we start. I don't know if that languishing was speaking for you. You know, everybody has their own form of languishing. Uh, you know, and it'll take it. It'll take its own form in you, and oftentimes it's unconscious. And as people even mentioned, you try to avoid it. So uh, in the article, it talked a lot about a lot of the uh, problems with languishing is it's unconscious and it sneaks up on you in all kinds of ways you don't even know it's there. 
because you're in a, mostly in avoidance of it. So, um, you know, it seems like uh, the background of this is fairly obvious. Uh, you know, uh, we know that historically that it's extremely important that we all have a narrative story about ourselves. Uh, that narrative story sort of organizes our lives and it has a sort of uh, set of principles involved in it or ideology that sort of organizes it or a set of values that sort of organize it. And then uh, that set, that narrative that we construct about ourselves, the question is whether it matches the world uh, of experience that we're getting through the senses uh, in the world that we live in with that narrative voice. When those things don't match very well, it creates a tremendous amount of fundamental anxiety, not, not anxiety on the surface, not an anxiety of a problem anxiety, but actually a fundamental anxiety because we don't actually know even where to look for the answers since uh, the narrative doesn't fit uh, the actual experiences that we're having. So I think we're in one of those eras. We were in one of those eras in the late 1800s when Nietzsche said the same thing, that the main thing he was talking about was the problem between uh, the narrative that we had and the world that we live in didn't match each other. And therefore, if we didn't create a new uh, narrative, we would be alienated to nature, ourselves, uh, each other, and so forth. So uh, that's that alienation has continued, and I think now we find ourselves even more in that alienation of the problem of narrative, because we, we need to have a functional narrative. Now, there's a history to that. I mean, we should all uh, see where we've arrived at this place fairly obviously through a process where I would call it traditionalism. We had a common narrative. Everyone within a culture shared a common narrative. You're either inside the culture or outside. So you could be a rebel, but you couldn't be a rebel inside the culture. Uh, there was like traditional culture has a truth uh, of a way of thinking that everyone mostly accords with. It has something like a God or a world or a set of values or a set of myths or something that forms the basis of it. And, and, there, and that's the truth. Everybody lives within the construct of the truth. So there's not really a question about that. Now, obviously that traditional system doesn't, it, it exists in the world today. And we can find a lot of traditionalists still around for sure. And of course, within the modern world, when the traditionalists are, are gonna be more fundamentalist, because the thing about a traditionalist, they believe their views to be true for everyone, uh, whether the other person believes it or not. So a traditionalist believes the truth is the truth, whether anyone else believes that truth or not is still the truth. Uh, as we moved into modernism in the 18, 1900s, you know, sort of philosophically, culturally, we moved into a recognition that we're different narratives of different cultures, that there was a perspectivism that if we're looking at the meaning of a particular narrative story, that you had to look at the structure, uh, the, the hermeneutic structure of the culture you're in. Indian culture at a certain time, Chinese culture at a certain time, American culture, so there's an entire construct of meaning in which the narrative was formed. And then all that has to happen is the narrative fits the structure of reality that, that's in, in that particular perspective. So uh, we begin to see, though, in the process of modernism that the perspectives are relative. There isn't one single truth. There are many different truths, but still the truths are a fundamental perspective. And we get our meaning and narrative within a larger a larger construct of ideology or culture or something. Then we move into what people generally call postmodernism. And so we're at the way, way, way late, late stages of, of, of post postmodernism. And the, 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 the major factor of that way of thinking is that even these ideologies uh, have hidden elements of hierarchy and power prejudice and so forth in them, even the, the different perspectives that we're using as a whole, even though it's a different perspective than another, it still hides hierarchies, power structures, and so forth. So then the only place then to look is ultimately that you can trust is your own experience. And then at first it was your own experience of your own thought, but then people became suspicious of their thoughts. So then it became, you can only trust your own emotions. 
But anybody that's tried to trust their own emotions knows that is a roller coaster every day. Uh, and trusting your own emotion is, is inherently unstable. So I went to visceral. The only thing you can trust is how you feel viscerally about what's going on. So as we move down that road, there's increasing and increasing amount of uh, anxiety uh, in, 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 in developing a narrative that's so kind of unstable within this very, you know, the very heart of the narrative is unstable. So uh, anyway, I mean, it, it's very clear in a kind of historical context how, how we got to where we are. Uh, we now realize, you know, now we take the view that you, you choose that you choose your own narrative based upon uh, the emotional, your experience of your own emotional life. And then because of the anxieties of the, that narrative not really fitting the world around us, whatever narrative we're forming through that process does not really fit the crises of the world around us. There's again, another layer and level, a tremendous amount of anxieties. In the 60s and 70s, as there was a lot of loneliness and alienation in that, uh, people moved to becoming more tribal. And what the tribalness did is it gave people to, could, could join together with shared emotional experience, shared uh, aspects of their experience that they had in common. And insofar as they shared the common experiences, they could then kind of share a tribal perspective towards what was going on uh, and feel like they're part of a community. Now, of course, we know that tribalism has become extremely difficult because it's fragmented and fragmented and fragmented uh, larger cultures into all kinds of subcultures that uh, are, you know, have, have various kinds of tribal identities and ideologies. So then on top of that, we have the problem of media. We have the problem of media, internet, so forth and so forth. That's, that's even fragmented the in, input of sense data to people even more. And as people look into uh, the internet for, and, and the various social platforms for their identity, then you can see even more that, that there's a greater and greater fragmentation of people's identity and narrative. And there's more and more anxiety around that narrative. And as you look into the internet for, look for your identity through Instagram, so forth and so forth and so forth, then you can see that uh, there's, there's, a, there's a cycle where you're constantly getting the, uh, the fear, anxieties, the, 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 the media itself lives off of drama and anxiety and fear and uh, it gets your attention through negative aspects of your emotion and the immediacy of, of, of negative drama and so forth. So you can see that the levels of anxiety were like at maybe three or four levels of anxiety when we look into like going back to our narrative to try to use that to make sense out of, of, of what's going on. Then you put that on top of, these major crises of COVID, when you take all of that I've said before, it was all there before COVID. And when you take that narrative and its interpretation and then deals with narrative, it becomes basically overwhelming because there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to look for a place that you could agree upon within yourself or with other people in a shared value or sense of direction that you have some certainty uh, will actually lead you in a meaningful direction or lead you out of the malaise that you're feeling like you're in. Uh, so the basic fundamental problem with all this is that every place that someone's looking is unstable. If you're looking at the narrative, it's unstable. If you're looking out into the world of the sense experience of the senses coming in, it's completely unstable. And it's also being manipulated through algorithms back to your own, through your own process. So trying to find something stable there is pretty much impossible because that's constantly changing into itself. If you go to your emotions, if you say, well, the only place I can go is my emotions, the emotions are inherently unstable because they're constantly changing. 
So we're basically living in a situation where uh, people have no idea where to look to ground their experience in a solid place that they can be, they can trust their experience, their interpretation of the experience that's going on. They don't know what to trust. Nobody knows what to trust. They can't even trust their own narrative voice. Now, from a Buddhist view, if, if anyone, you know, the people here who have a Buddhist experience or even the ones that don't, uh, nobody should be surprised about any of this if you have been studying uh, from, a, from a Buddhist view, uh, human experience uh, and, and how to describe how human experience operates from what the Buddha was talking about. First of all, the first thing he said is everything's impermanent. So I hope everybody realized when they got into Buddhism that they, he actually meant it was impermanent. He wasn't actually making that up. He wasn't kidding you. You know, I know you all think he was kidding you. It's not actually impermanent, but he actually meant it was, was actually impermanent. <laughs> and uh, so the idea that you would find something in the senses or in the emotions or in the thoughts that are permanent you're already warned before you even start into looking at the problem of the situation that it is impermanent. Everything is impermanent. Okay, and so you say, well, then I look at the you, the you are the narrator that we've been talking about. But the Buddha said about the narrator, that is completely constructed. That is completely malleable. That is completely malleable to the times, to the culture, to the circumstances, to the conditional. There is no stability. There's no inherently stability in the you that everybody's looking to, the narrative you. That's the story you're telling yourself and constructed, and you constructed from your childhood through your adolescence into life. That narrative is a total construction. And, it, and it's not only that it's uh, inherently unstable, it's actually totally constructed to the conditions. If, it, if, if the conditions construct, a dysfunctional narrative, then looking back at the dysfunctional narrative, since it's a construct, you, you would assume there's no place to look there. Now, at some times in, in history, that narrative seemed to be more functional than others. If people have been around for 80 or 90 years, or say even 70 something years, you might even remember a time when most people actually believed in a sort of collective narrative construct that they held together more or less with the same set of values, a lot of assumed values that we don't find around us today. That was the selves, the narrators of those times that felt comfortable with each other in that narration was still a construction. And the reason it felt like it worked was because it was a shared narration constructed together in a way that they collectively believed and were willing to believe a set of ideologies and thoughts that held together created some sort of coherency of culture or society. That isn't because society was coherent. It wasn't because there's such a thing as reason. It was because in various particular times, the na narrations that are constructed are, have different kinds of characteristics within the construct of particular cultures. So we should not at all be surprised that looking back to the narrative is not gonna work. If we look back to the narrative, we're gonna, we're gonna find something we've constructed that is dysfunctional. So the only place we can look from a Buddhist point of view is to look past the, narrate, the, the narration to the narrator. Who, who, is, who, who is creating the narration? Who, who created the narrator? What's the awareness? Who is the awareness moment to moment to moment? The awareness that's constructing who is this awareness behind the narration that is observing? In, in Husserl, it would be the disinterested observer. We had a little bit of it in Descartes when he said, I think, therefore I am, which is actually said, I doubt. And behind that doubt was an assumption of a, of a subject there, an I am there uh, behind the doubt and, and, and thought that was the foundation of then, everything came from that experience of the, of the fundamental experience of the immediate experience of, 
uh, whoever's reporting that they're alive, whoever reporting that they're uh, aware. You have to go back to that awareness. Uh, we find it also in Sartre's, uh, we find some of it in existentialism. We, we find bits and pieces of looking back into this. Uh, we find it a little bit in Heidegger and when, when we're looking at being and being in time, we see an element of looking back, especially in his language stuff when he's talking about the poet and the arisal of words from the poet. We see a kind of looking back to being uh, again, looking back to being, each of these are different than what the are different in actual experience and what the Buddha was talking about in the totality of what he's talking about. But they have a sense of that kind of move back to ground in the experience, in the immediate experience of a person, in the immediate experience of the awareness of a person. And then from that, as you settle into that experience of awareness and, and become uh, have some sense of, of stillness and solidity in that experience, then you can use that to either pay attention to the conditional, to, to what's going on in the conditional. All the senses are, are giving you all kinds of information. So from that position, you can observe the conditional from a much more stable place that you're not totally overwhelmed by anxiety and all these other kinds of emotions, or you could use it to look deeper into emptiness. You could use it in a more metaphysical way to look into a deeper sense of that towards emptiness, or ultimately you could use it for both. If you became really, really skilled, you could use it for looking both into the conditional and into the foundational. So it seems to me at this moment in time, um, the sense of languishing that people have and the conditions we find ourselves in and the complete disconnect between narrative and the uh, general realities that we exist within is a really, really uh, perfect time for Buddhism to uh, present itself to the modern world with some new language to offer the world an actual completely different approach to solidify the ground of, 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 of foundational existence at a very different place than narrative uh, sensation, you know, world ideology, and all the ways that all the places that people are looking for it now. So on that uh, note, I'm going to stop so that we can leave time for questions and comments. So there's a couple of thoughts on the issue. So we talked about kind of this, um, not having something to rely on, and it can be a very long process to, to develop something that we can rely on. But then in the meantime, you know, we have our, our lives that we're going about every day. Um, so like, what kind of things can we do maybe on a daily basis like that can help us not get so dragged down by the blahness? Well, um, again, if we go to a Buddha, the Buddha's answer to that is uh, we'll never be blah if we open up our heartfulness and loving kindness and compassion to actually really paying attention and caring about the others around us, the nature around us, ourselves in a more caring way, a more compassionate way. As soon as you make that move to uh, pay attention to somebody else in a compassionate way with generosity, you completely lose your blahs. There's no way to be in blahs if you're in uh, um, and a true hearted generosity. So that's the Buddha. I mean, the Buddha said basically, if you'll be generous, and if you'll be generous and if you'll be patient. And what do you mean by patient is uh, listening to your mind, what's arising in your mind, the thoughts, emotions, and so forth, observing and listening to them without reacting, without jumping on them, attaching, without reacting without judging, and then do the same thing with others. 
give them space to be the other different from you. That's not just a projection of your needs and desires. But again, to do that, you have to open up the space of listening, generosity, and compassion. So in our immediate everyday life, uh, the way out of the blahs is our, our, act our community, de developing a sense of community of being compassionate, having loving kindness, uh, compassion, sympathetic joy, uh, that's the Buddha suggested those four that you, that what you needed was uh, to open up your open heartedness so you felt the glow of an open heartedness, the spaciousness of open heartedness. Again, he was careful to say, don't bring that down on somebody in like love because that collapses that open heartedness down to attachment. So you have this open heartedness. When you see somebody suffering, you have compassion. When you see somebody having a lot of joy and really excited about something, you feel sympathetic joy for that. You don't feel jealousy for them having joy. You are really happy about their joy. And then this leads to a sense of equanimity, that you have a sort of sense of equanimity, uh, constantly observing, still not overly, uh, very aware but not necessarily emotionally moved by the circumstances. So that's by far the fastest way. The fastest way is to relate to each other in a compassionate way. Thanks, Doug. Um, we have another question from Bernie. Um, and the question is, if you could elaborate more on how this Buddhist awareness is different from relying on a sense of um, the emotional or the rational sense of self? So the emotional and rational sense of self, emotions uh, actually are experiences of the past that are arising in the present. If you look carefully at what your emotions are, they are, when you had an experience in the past, you had a, 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 an interpretation of that experience. There's two ways that interpretation arises. One is emotional with an emotional charge and the other is a representation of it called the thought. So we have thoughts and emotions that are representations of our past experience that now rise by association in our senses to our present experience. So as we're going through the present experience of our senses, that's including the mind as a sense, we're having uh, a constant flow of sense experiences. And those sense experiences have these associations with emotions and thoughts that have occurred in the past. And when the association arises, the emotion arises or the thought arises. The emotions and thoughts are not you. They're, they're a past interpretation coming up in the present that is not you in the present at all. It is the past in the present. If, if, you, if you can learn to meditate, you can be in the present in a way that all of you can do this with very little work. Actually, to do what I'm saying now does not take that much meditation. You could learn to observe what's going on in your mind and be present and actually observe that uh, the emotions arising in the mind, actually watch them, uh, and not only in the mind, but in the, in the stomach and wherever they're coming up viscerally. So you can observe them viscerally arising and you can actually see that the mind chooses to go with that emotion or not. So you choose at a certain level. If you can see it, you can actually see how there's a choice made about what emotions you want to hang on to and hang out in and what thoughts you want to grasp onto and hang out in. So you have to find the place in your own experience and awareness where you can observe the emotions and thoughts arising because the emotions and thoughts arising are not you. They are the past you arising by association in the present. If you want to actually be present in the present, you need to not you need to not have those continually take you over 
in the present and keep you on an emotional roller coaster. That is not you, that, that emotional, the emotions and thoughts are not you at all. They're not even, they're just remnants of the past arising in the present. So the difference is, is the you I'm talking about, the place I'm talking about looking for is the actual awareness that observes the arisal of an emotion and the choice of whether to go with that emotion or not, or just let it pass without grasping onto it. And you can see eventually you can choose, you can't choose the emotions that are arising because those are from the past, but you can choose the emotions that you wanna hang out in the present and the emotions that will take precedent in the future by what you attend to in the present. So what we're asking people to do is to look into that awareness that's behind and the ground of where emotions actually take their existence in the attention of your mind on them. If you take your attention away from emotion, it has no place to be. It only exists through your attention. If you pull your attention away, the emotion ceases to exist in the present. So you are tremendously empowered and that's just human. I mean, we're not talking about any Buddha here or anything. We're not talking about Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. We're, we're just talking about human, human nature. You know, we're not talking about even Buddhism here. We're just talking about the human has that capacity. They were born with that capacity of that kind of awareness. That's what you're born with. That's what your, your awareness, your human awareness has that capacity as its basic existence, basic being. All we have to do is get back to who we are. It's, it, it's not, there's nothing metaphysical. There's nothing transcendental, transcendental here. We're not on the 10 grounds of the Bodhisattva and the Abhatamsaka. We're not in any, we're not in any uh, supernatural place here. We're just being human. Uh, hey. Um, my, so my question was, um, I think you've already partially answered it, but at the beginning, uh, you said that this is a really good moment uh, for Buddhism to come in into the West, to come in into this kind of em emptiness of uh, an ideology that actually makes sense. Uh, so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, Buddhism will have to reformulate itself in a different language, you know, like it did in China, like it did, I mean, you know, it went through hundreds and hundreds of years of reformulating from India uh, and in all these different countries that Buddhism went into it, it reformulated what it was saying and practicing within the culture that it came into. Yeah, Buddhism has not yet in Western culture uh, gotten to kindergarten, hasn't gotten to putting swings up in nursery school. It's still very, very early. It still ha it's all in a foreign language. It's all in a language of dharmas and blah, 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 karma, and nobody understands what the heck's going on. So it's all in foreign language. It has to be brought into the language that people uh, are used to working within. Once it can bring it into the, to the, to the language that people are used to and, and, and keep all of its same principles and stuff, I think it will find in this moment in time, it will find incredible numbers of people that will be interested in it because uh, it doesn't depend on ideology. It doesn't depend on a narrate, narrator. It doesn't depend on uh, authorities outside the cell. That's the key thing at this moment in time is m people under a certain age don't believe in any authority outside of their own experience. They don't even believe in ideas. They believe in their emotional and visceral experience. That's perfect because that's exactly the Buddha. The Buddha is actually saying you can't trust ideology. You can't trust narr narrator. You can't trust these things are all impermanent. You have to look deeper than that into the into the mind, into the experience, into the visceral. So I think it fits exactly where people are. I think the hard part still uh, that the the big thing that we're going to have to get through into a modern context is the problem of impulsiveness, erotic impulsiveness. There, there's a tremendous value in Western culture for erotic impulsiveness. It actually goes all back all the way to, to Plato and Diotima's speech. So this creative 
kind of force of erotic energy it goes back, Eros goes back all the way Plato, and then we got Freud's libido, we got Schopenhauer's will, we've got endless uh, versions of this force of creativity and so forth and so forth. And it's, and it's highly valued. This creative erotic charge is highly valued. I, I know it well. I was in the 60s. <laughs> I, I, I won't, I won't uh, go into it, but I can give you lots of renditions in 60, 68 to 75 of this. So, um, so the, the issue here is really tricky when we come across Buddhism, came across Master Wa, and we were a bunch of hippies back there in the 70s, 60s and 70s. Uh, the big battleground was uh, this impulsive eroticism, the freedom of impulsive eroticism versus the freedom of a still mind observing. So there's a lot of people that don't want to give up their, the mythology of their eroticism. They, 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 the, 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 the urging, surging dynamics of whatever that is. It's not just sexual. I mean, it has a sexual aspect to it, but it's not just sexual. It's much more than sexual. And it's aesthetic. It's a lot about the aestheticism. It's a lot about a lot of stuff. We could spend a lot of time on this, but we won't. But uh, that is the biggest, I think almost all of Buddhism uh, can be translated in a way that people will actually be very, very, by getting past, and where does that hit uh, ground is in precepts. So as soon as you start talking about precepts, people get pretty nervous, okay? Uh, and the reason they get nervous is because it seems like that's some kind of moral thing that's some sort of like thing that's like a repression of their impulsive, instinctual drives and desires. Uh, so that has to be explained. There has to be a tremendous amount of explanation and exploration and experience of what it feels like to have the freedom of stillness versus the freedom of erotic, of erotic, uh, you know, movement. And I don't know. I think the reason we're we're going fairly slow so far in the West of making headway is I think that people actually have to experience that for themselves. I don't think you can tell people about that at all. I don't think anybody's gonna believe anything about that that you say. I think they actually have to have enough experience of the, mind, the stillness of mind and feel the joy, not the repression, of the stillness of mind and the freedom of the mind to see that the freedom of the mind in stillness and awareness is a more expansive freedom than the freedom of impulse. But you can't say that, you have to be able to experience that. Does that make any sense there? The rest of it, the rest of it, I don't think the rest of it, I think the impermanence, I think the senses, it's very empirical. I mean, it's, it's con talking about contact. It's very, uh, in a Western philosophical tradition, if you read Hume, Hume would sound like a Buddhist sutra. Hume's concerning human understanding. If you read it, it sounds like a Buddhist sutra on senses, on the senses and no self, no, no nothing on the other side of contact that you can prove. I mean, you know, the deep, deep aspects of empiricism uh, have uh, are actually better Buddhist texts than some of the Buddhist texts. Probably Hume's a better Buddhist on the senses than most Buddhists, right? So, um, we can find lots of examples of the major aspects of the causation. So the 12 links and everything being causal, everything being impersonally causal. It, it, there's, a, there's this tremendously scientific, uh, Buddhism has a very scientific orientation towards experience uh, that's very conducive to, uh, to, mo to most people in their modern thinking. It would just, it, the only problem that it would do is again, it just wouldn't go with a science when it becomes an ideology of total explanation. It, if it can stay, if science can stay within its realm of that which is measurable and repeatable in certain kinds of material frameworks, then the Buddhism has no problem with that being part of the description of the conditional. You know, well, what's the problem? It's only when, when, when science becomes an ideology, uh, which is a whole argument within science itself, when it becomes an ideology that explains everything, 
And of course, as I point out all the time, the reason that it has all these gaps in explanation and gets away with it is because it has this wonderful out called probability. <laughs> so at any time there's a little problem, we'll just call it, there's a probability, there's a chance and probability. Okay, so, uh, so I think there's a lot of, I mean, I could go through right now 30 things that I think link, but I think I pointed out the main thing that we're gonna struggle with for a little while. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so there's another question talking a little bit about your previous answer about this human capacity for awareness. And the question is, how does one move from this human capacity that you mentioned about having awareness of emotions and then not giving emotions attention? So how do you move that to the Buddha nature? Uh, you, well, you're, you're, that stillness of awareness is the six consciousness you know what i'm talking about in yoga chara terms i'm talking about uh concentrating in the six conscious you know you're stealing the six consciousness you have to start there because until the six consciousness is still and you have a little bit of observation of that you're not going to be able to see anything then the question is where you turn that so if you're interested in seeing the buddha nature then i've got about two libraries worth of shastras and uh, sutras uh, for you. Okay, that's when you start reading. I mean, if if at the if if you are in that, develop that human quality, that basic awareness, and begin to calm, and you want to take that to the to the ground of the Tathagata Garbha, the 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 Buddha nature, uh, then that's what all those texts. The Ten Grounds, the Avatamsika, the Sharangama, the Lankavatara, Lanka all the Shastras, uh, you know, Asanga, Vashubantu, uh, you know, Nagarjuna, you know, all the Pali all, all those texts, they're all explaining how to take from that human quality into the sort deeper and deeper and deeper into the ground of that, of, of that six kinds of stillness. And there's all kinds of more and more subtle explanations and more and more subtle practices, because the only way you're going to be able to do that is through meditation, through what we call meditation, concentrating the mind in very long periods of samadhi, in different stages of samadhi and so forth, and also develop the merit, meaning create the conditions that are conducive to that kind of meditation. Because remember, you had to create the conditions in your life that you're not paying rent, you're not taking care of, so, you know, you have to create the conditions where you can do that kind of practice. So at the same time as you're trying to get there in the direct mind of meditation, you have to be creating the conditions through the merit, what we call merit and blessings that will get you to the conditions that you can do that kind of practice, that kind of meditation. The two eventually come together over time. The merit, the blessings and merit begin to come together. And then if you use those for meditating and cultivating, you'll gradually bring forth the Buddha mind, the Bodhi mind will gradually arise naturally. Again, it's not something you have to look for. You just have to, as you still the sixth consciousness, you just go to further and further and further depths of stillness, further and further depths of Stilling the stilling, stilling the stilling of the stilling, stilling the stilling of the stilling and the stilling. You're just going down in depth, 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 depth. That way you're going to ground. But at the same time, in the Mayana, of course, you're responsible, your 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 compassion and your your loving kindness and your caring for other sentient beings and your involvement in helping other sentient beings is equally important. And so your efforts that sutra texts are also explaining how to engage other peoples in community in a way that makes relationship work, community work, nature, how we live in nature. Look at the monastic uh, lifestyle. You know, it may be, I mean, I'm not joking, it may be that the monastic lifestyle might be the only survivable lifestyle on the earth at some point. One meal a day, simple existence, not needing a big house, not need too many cars, you know, so forth and so on. If you look at the monastic, uh, the, the monastic lifestyle, it is a lifestyle for environmentalism. The city of 10,000 Buddhas, one meal a day, blah, 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 blah. 
It was more of a statement of creating a community that is functional in the long term with the environmental crises that we face than it was even about a community that was just for religious purposes of having a pure place to meditate and so forth. So I don't know, did I answer that or did I go off? I think a little bit of both. <laughs> Um, so we have only a few minutes left and there's two more questions. Um, so I, maybe I'll just read them both and then you can figure out how to answer both of them. So one person's asking about when you say to bring Buddhism to the language of the place, do you mean language per se or the culture of the place? And then both, they give. Both. Yeah, both, both the culture and the language. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's even more than culture and language, it's the mores. You know, I would go even further to the mores of the place. Different uh, assumptions in the value system and the way people interact with each other, the symbol system of each other and so forth. And uh, as Buddhism comes in, it doesn't really, it isn't an ideology. So. As long as you're talking within the principles, you can you can adjust the the metaphors and analogies and ways to describe those major major principles of of how to use the mind in any kind of culture you find it in. It's no different between just like each individual is only uh, in the present is. Uh, being taken over by the past with emotions and thoughts and so far as it allows those, those to take it up, the same thing you could say about cultures, mores, and language. Uh, insofar as they're in the past, those are the symbols that are arising into the present from the entire cultural uh, collective mind, so to speak. And in that collective common mind, if you can find a way to explain things in that mind, then it can get over much easier. And since the principles are about the mind's observation, where the mind's observing, you can do that in many, many, many different frames of reference and forms. You don't have to be stuck in, you know, Chinese or Indian or, uh, you know, other, other uh, cultures who, I mean, the work that was done to bring Buddhism into China by hundreds of thousands, millions of interpreters, translators, explainers. I mean, it went on for hundreds and hundreds of years of massive numbers of people. We're only like a few people. We're, we're <laughs> if we were at the level of China after a couple hundred years, we'd have, you know, 20 monasteries going on with thousands of people translating, which we don't have. So uh, it has to, yeah, it, but it has to be, it has to be thought through to then match the experience of people at the time and in the culture you're talking about. And then just so this final question um, relates back to the article and for people who haven't read it, um, they propose this idea of getting into the flow state. And um, so this question is about, are there dangers in the concentration of this flow state? Like for example, becoming obsessive and what's the difference between this and the Buddhist concentration and stillness? Uh well, I don't know if everybody read the flow. He he suggested in this article on languishing that Adam Grant, he said that the solution to this sense of stagnation and emptiness, this sense of that you feel like you're muddling through the day, looking through a foggy mirror, uh, that it dulls your motivation, disrupts your ability to focus. And you may not even notice it, he says, because you may not even notice that your delight is dwindling and you have less drive and that you're slipping slowly into a kind of solitude and you can't even see your own suffering. He says one of the most difficult aspects of this languishing is you can't even see your own suffering because it isn't all the way to depression. It's somewhere between, it's not all the way to being depressed. You're still functional and you think you're, you know, you're still, you're still able to function. It's not that you've gone to depression, so you haven't gone all the way to depression. He, he suggests as a solution to that, he says, you need to get into the flow. But getting in the flow, in his description, it has many Buddhist elements. <laughs> okay, the first is, uh, he says, very interesting. He says the main way of getting in the flow is you need to be totally absorbed in a project. He says you're distracted. The reason that you're lost in this 
uh, you'll never get out of this, uh, this languishing if you don't get the mind focused. And getting the mind focused is getting absorbed in a project where you're single-mindedly working on that without all the distraction. And practice for longer periods of time, staying concentrated on one project and not being distracted. So you might only be able to do 20 minutes before you have to grab your, your iPhone or whatever because you can't take it anymore, not finding out what somebody was going to like or not like you, or your Instagram just went to 40,000 people and you're just looking out of the 40,000 people if the right person saw it and retrack us out of all those videos. Blah, 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 blah. And then uh, because your identity, because you, you know, like you, you, you have to sell yourself every second. So if you don't look for a second, my grand, grand it didn't have the phone. We were up in the mountains. My grand, the, the Wi-Fi went out for 15 minutes and it went, we had total hysteria because I'm not in touch with my friends for 15 minutes. I will lose track with all my friends. They won't even like me. I will have not responded to them. They think I don't like them. I'm not getting anything back. My identity has collapsed. I don't exist. I might as well be dead. I'm gonna throw myself in the lake now. Stop, stop, it's only been 10 minutes. Maybe in another 10 minutes, your identity will come back. You think I'm joking, Just, I'm not joking. Okay, so I don't think people can understand how profound this uh, distraction, this sense of constant distraction is and how much anxiety is built into that. How much your identity is always, uh, you're, you're basically selling yourself every minute. And if you stop selling yourself for a minute, you cease to exist because nothing's coming back as feedback to, te to tell you who you are and what you're doing. So this state of absorption you can see is actually a very Buddhist, you get into a project where you stay into it and practice for longer and longer periods of time, staying in the concentrated flow, the flow of the absorption in, in a project. And you, you got to stay, uh, stay on a task with your whole attention on it for increasingly longer periods of time. Then he says you need quiet time to reflect, process, and focus. <laughs> so... That sounds like something we were talking about, more or less. Okay, so you need time to sit quietly, reflect, and focus. This is what you meant. And you need to look for joy. You have to look for small moments of joy that you can find in anything, anything that's going on during the day. A, a flower, a butterfly, a blue sky. You, you emphasize the joy in the smallest moments of anything that can can elicit that and begin to look for uh, look for a sense of progress and motivation through very small steps of success. Do not look at the big picture, it'll overwhelm you. So he suggests that you uh, make very small successful steps at a very small level and build up and don't get so caught up in the larger scale meta, meta uh, scale of things. Um, try, to, try to take small, meaningful steps. And then he says, you need to join in meaningful conversations where you re-engage and focus your energy in relationship with somebody else, in, in focused, uh, attentive, being there conversations with people and focus your energy on listening and communicating and so forth with people. Those are what he meant by flow. So I would, I would suggest all those flowing things would be good. Thanks, Doug. Um, just looking at the time, we're a few minutes over now. So um, I just wanted to wrap things up and just thank everybody for, for joining us and beginning this conversation. Um, and we hope that this kind of actually just starts a conversation with yourself and with others. And if you're interested in having, talking more about things like this, having more of these dialogues, we hope to do more events in the future on related topics. Um, 
And we actually have another event coming up uh, at the end of October on October 28th. We're going to, it's going to be more of a discussion based event. It'll be a smaller group and it's going to be on the topic of embodied wisdom. It'll be a reading group event. So we'll email a reading a week ahead of time and then um, a DRBU faculty will lead a discussion kind of like how we do at the university. Um, and we'll send a link for that in the email and share it in the chat box. Um, but if people have, um, have a, any more questions, we'll stay on for a few more minutes, but for other people, you're all welcome to drop off. Um, it looks like there are a couple more questions in the chat box. So yeah, we'll answer a couple more questions, but for everyone else, we really are glad you're able to make it today and hope you continue in this exploration of our human existence. <laughs> yeah, good comment about how we're hyper ultra plugged in these days and it's increasingly difficult to cultivate stillness unless we really plug ourselves out. But the one good thing is you can just unplug. So it, it is, in some ways it's really uh, hard because it's so uh, effusive, you know, it's so all incoming. But on the other hand, it's kind of really easy because it's so easy to turn it off. I mean, it's all your own, you can feel it in yourself, right? I'm not even involved in it and I can feel it, you know, like I'm the least involved in it probably of anybody, of anybody that anybody knows. And I can still feel, you know, the draw of it. Uh, that you're drawn to want to see what is happening in some kind of way. So, and I'm not on any platforms at all. I'm just trying to find out what happened, like in the general sense of economics, whether ever grand made their payment, their, their interest payments, so they didn't go bankrupt today in China. I mean, really interesting stuff that you guys are all very interested in, I'm sure. That's the scope of my great interest, you know. I'm sure that would draw you into it, you know. So, but even then I can feel... So, you know, this is a really important thing for everybody to really, you really, the only way you're going to be able to make progress on this is to actually discipline yourself to turn it off. There's no way to have it sitting there on your lap or around and making yourself available to the, to the, to the siren's call, uh, to the pull of it and, and, and not make progress. You're going to, you're going to have to give up the pull of that for a half an hour, an hour every day in a really disciplined way. Or you can't, you won't make any progress because it's just too powerful. Uh, so it looks like there's people still staying on. So I'll, I'll just ask more questions as they come in. Um, so Megan had a question about how do we separate what's going on around us from our own feelings? Um, like what if we feel guilty, feeling happy or feeling good when those around us don't? Yeah, that's a good, a good question. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I think that's why if you, if you heard uh, what we were talking about, I tried to give some sort of equal measure in the Mayana. I was trying to give equal measure. And I do think that in the Mayana, there is equal measure to uh, the blessings that create the conditions for you to be able to cultivate you gather from your compassion, from your generosity, from your uh, helpfulness, from doing your part in the community, to not freeloading, to give anybody a ride if you can. You know, I mean, the basic aspects of being uh, a helpful, friendly, good human being and being as generous as you can with your time and caring and being compassionate without any without expecting to you know hit on each other i mean just out of friendship not for a purpose of <laughs> i'm getting more merit here to hit on this person or something. i mean just this friendly kind of helpful caring that creates the blessings and the merit that creates the conditions to do the cultivation so in some ways the interaction in the larger community and the larger uh, causes to 
to protect nature and, and our natural surroundings. In the beginnings of cultivation are probably more important than even uh, the meditation per se, because they create the conditions for that meditation to actually be able to go somewhere. And the conditions where you actually have time to do that uh, with the conditions to do it. So um, I would start, I mean, that, that's why I think, uh, that's why by the time you get to meditation, you should not feel guilt because you should have taken care of the people around you enough in your listening to who they are as, as an other, attending to the other person's existence in a careful, caring way, uh, participating and doing your share in the community. If you do all these kind of things, then as you cultivate, you won't feel yourself to be so guilty because it won't be a move of selfishness that's sort of a narcissistic move of escape. I would say a lot of people doing meditation are using it to escape, uh, are using it to escape in a sort of narcissistic self-referencing sort of place. So I think that's, um, that's why I think um, the compassionate aspects of the Bodhisattva and studying what, how, the, how you are practicing your Bodhisattva nature is as, if not more important, in the early stages of what you're doing in terms of practice. And I think that by, the, I, think, I, think, I think everybody would find that if they do enough of that, if they're enough caring, if they're enough not selfish, that the place where that guilt arises from the stillness isn't really there. You know what I mean? It did, the guilt is because you're selfish. The guilt is because the meditation is really because you're selfish. <laughs> and there's a lot of selfish meditation, you know? So uh, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe guilt in meditation is a good uh, indicator, a good marker of something that you need to look into to see why it would be that, uh, you know, what is it that's coming up in with me about guilt? Because that, I mean, we could talk about guilt a lot because guilt is a really big problem. Uh, guilt is a really big problem because uh, people think guilt is, I mean, guilt is an equally illusory self as all the rest of self, right? Guilt is just another construction and it's a feeling of doing something. It's an, in, you interject uh, a value that then by you committing an act of some kind, you feel guilty about. So what you have to do is see whether that guilt is a social guilt or a fundamental guilt uh, that actually has, um, where you've actually done, done wrong in a fundamental sense in your character. So there's two different kinds of, the word guilt is referring to two different experiences. One is important to be able to recognize, and that's an action taken that's a disrespectful of other people or yourself, and is hurtful to yourself and other people, and that whatever that tells you, I shouldn't be doing this, is an internal voice uh, uh, involved in, I would call, for lack of a better word, your character. And then there's another uh, guilt, which has to do with your, your social being, the, the society you're in, and your identity within that society that you've interjected from the culture and society around you. That's an internal voice, uh, not shaming you about aspects of character, but actually playing off of uh, cultural, cultural mores and making you feel, feel guilty because you haven't succeeded enough to be productive enough, you know, to be, to be and to be productive enough is not, is, is probably a capitalist guilt, right? 
that's based on a cultural capitalist aspect. So I think this thing, I'm, I'm just, I, we could go on on this topic for a long time, probably should stop. Yeah. But you need to be very careful to look at what the phenomena of that is in your process, because mm -hmm. you could be thrown off by it. There's one question I want to, I think maybe this will be the last one and then we'll let you go and rest, Doug. But from Sophie, um, this question, I, I really like it. So what if one feels a general blondness toward life itself, like life is pretty meaningless and purposeless? Well, now you just described a lot of people. You got you got a mass of people there. That, that You just probably got 100 million people in the country, you know, so. Uh, so, uh, that you know, uh, you you know you're gonna have to force it. You know you're gonna have to force it. So uh, the reason that people have that sense of blah meaninglessness is because they've given up on meaning, and you could have given up on meaning for a lot from experiences. You could be giving up on meaning on disappointment about on the overwhelming quality of the problems that we're facing. In other words, it's a kind of giving up. It could be for many different reasons. So, so you have to know the specifics of why people have given up. With, in the face of virus, the virus, a lot of people have given up You know, any focused future because what's the use? I mean, if we're gonna argue over you know, my right to wear a face mask or not, I can kill my whole family. I mean, what are we doing? I mean, you, know, you, you kind of lose track of what are we even talking about, right? So there is this larger sense of uh, meaninglessness that, that, and it could be for many, many different reasons, but that you, you have to realize that the sense of meaningless is an actual choice of position. It isn't just happening to you. Again, I go back to no mood, emotion, or anything is happening to you. You're choosing to hang out in it. It's not, it's not who you are in a fundamental sense. It's what you're choosing to do, usually as escape, usually as defense mechanism, usually at, for many other reasons. You have to find out, you have to look into yourself to see why it is that you want to go down that road. And you have to see what it is, what's the purpose in your existence for being trapped in a meaningless blah that isn't going anywhere because there's some, it, it, it's, it's actually a defense mechanism from having, of being held accountable in any expectation. So for instance, one way that will come up is relationships that have gone really bad and are really disappointing. Then that state is a way to avoid future relationships in which there would be expectation because you can't even rustle up your energy to even talk to somebody. So then that keeps you from other relationships that might have the same outcome uh, of hurt, pain, suffering, so forth. And so it's a defense mechanism. The actual non-action is a defense mechanism that's keeping you from actually being held to some expectations that you no longer, you know, you no longer trust yourself. It's basically not trusting yourself. So you need to really look into it because it's a lot more complicated than simply being meaningless. There's a there's something in the meaninglessness that is a, a, a conscious or unconscious uh, mood or projection that has a purpose. It has another purpose in the meaninglessness. You have to find out what that other purpose is. So uh, again, there are chemical. There's all kinds of other things we can talk about. Reasons for different things. So we're not. We're only talking about it within the context of the, this conversation and this kind of conversation, where we're talking about a mass of people. Many of those people that are feeling these kind of experiences. Not everyone, because there's other reasons for these things. But most people, if they would look into the real reason for that mood or position or whatever that they are taking. They can find another purpose, another psychological purpose. Usually avoidance, defense, you know, other other kinds of stuff. So thank you, Doug. Um, I think we're a little bit, we're quite a bit over time. So I think we'll wrap this up and 
yeah, I really appreciate everybody being here and your the questions you've asked. And um, I look forward to seeing what else can grow from this. Um, yeah, and hope everybody can maybe take something of this with them and learn more about themselves or learn more about the world and how to be in the world. Language uh, a little less. Yeah, maybe, maybe languish a little less. We can bring about a little less languishing in the world. <laughs> yeah, I hope everybody got a little bit of a blah antidote tonight. <laughs> or maybe we, we just will understand our blahness better, which That's okay. is also helpful. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thank, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Take, Take care. care.